Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show. We give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is Mark Ellis. Welcome one and all to the best movie news show in the entire galaxy. My name is Mark. I have the confidence of a quarterback, but the talent of a water boy. And here on today's show, we are going to see that James Bond got a new distributor. The Greatest Showman gets a new trailer, and Ben Affleck, can he take my mantle as the king of segways <laughs> also here john schnapp you're tearing me apart mark <laughs> i saw the disaster artist Woo! yesterday it is awesome right. you gotta check that movie out it's fantastic also here clark wolf i got all the hot takes today you guys <laughs> in annapurna films <laughs> i'm over you <laughs> Clark Wolf coming in hot this morning. <laughs> Schnapp fresh off his screen of the disaster artist last night. And our production crew, well, they had ants in their coffee this morning. <laughs> so everybody dealing with something this morning. <laughs> Ashley, what are we kicking off with? On the week that Justice League hits theaters, Ben Affleck has again gone on record to say that he is, in fact, looking for a way to exit from the DCU. That may not come until Matt Reeves' proposed standalone Batman movie, but if Affleck's comments are to be believed, it could happen very soon. As part of a lengthy profile in USA Today, Affleck reveals he's looking for a good way to phase his Batman out of the DCEU, saying, The new Batman movie being developed by Matt Reeves is something I'm contemplating, says Affleck, who originally was tapped to direct. You don't do it forever, so I want to find a graceful and cool way to segue out of it. Mark, is this it? Is this confirmation? that Affleck is done with Batman or will he stick around for one more with Matt Reeves? You know, Ash, the way you asked that question seems like we might have been having conversations about this once you or twice say. in our history. <laughs> and here, yeah, it sounds like he is pretty much done with the character. When you have a movie coming out that stars you as the recruiter of a bunch of other superheroes and you're all teaming up to fight a bad guy, and you're saying that you want to segue out of it, and you're saying you're looking for a way to gracefully exit, probably means you're not going to be in Matt Reeves' Batman movie. At least he's looking for a cool way to segue out of it, as opposed to just not showing up again. So rather than have a Michael Keaton simply not returning and we replace him with Val Kilmer or George Clooney situation, we have a Ben Affleck could pop up in a future DCU movie for an act, and then gets knocked off and then somebody else has to take up the mantle and that is an interesting subplot or the main plot perhaps of the Matt Reeves Batman movie. I have my opinions on this, but I would defer to the stronger people on this table right now who have been saying for a while that they think Ben Affleck will not be appearing in a Matt Reeves Batman movie. Clark Wolf, do you have any idea who that person could oh, be? Oh, I'm just sitting here listening to the news, Mark. <laughs> Is there news today? <laughs> yeah, it's weird. What are, what are you guys talking yeah, about? Wait, do you think that's weird? Oh, you guys didn't hear? Ben so, Affleck. Breaking might... news. Yeah. What's that? What is that? What's going is, on? Is it Ben Affleck in, yeah. in a statement that we have never gotten wind of before? You're talking about Ben Affleck, Batfleck. He's the guy's no, but Bruce he's Batman, he's Batman. You guys know yeah. he's. Batman, why do you hate the yeah, DCU you, you so much, about? Mark? <laughs> what is, so, what are you, are you is he, he going to be on a Segway? Because those things aren't very easy to ride around on. You're is just spreading segue? rumors. What is wrong with... Oh, he said this? He he said this a number of times. Oh. And uh, you, Weird. too, were mm. two of the first people to believe that he mm. is looking, in fact, for a way to segue out of it. So, <laughs> so Clark, you hear this. Is this, the, is this the final nail in the coffin? Is this what is not only going to get believers already like you, but people who are naked? who said, no, Affleck's going to be Batman forever. Is this going to get them off that train? Well, uh, first of all, you all can send your apologies <laughs> to <laughs> me in the form of kisses and hugs. And, <laughs> um, and chocolates. And chocolates and coffees. Thank you, Starbucks fairy. Okay. And free coffee. And free please. coffee, preferably. No, look, I, 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 this is not official confirmation. However, I do think that Ben Affleck's saying he's contemplating doing the Batman uh, means that he is not all in. <laughs> this is a tagline from Justice League, get it? Okay, so um, I think that, <laughs> thanks guys. Um, I, I just think that Ben Affleck has always, I think since the beginning, 
was excited, but then maybe had a little bit of a rocky start. And also, look, it's no, in all seriousness, it's no small task to play this role. You physically, emotionally, and in terms of your scheduling commitments. Like, look at the reshoot situation on Justice League. This is a requirement that these actors, you're signing up for potential reshoots down the road and how long these reshoots might be. Like, Ben Affleck has a sustainable career on his own as an acclaimed director and as an actor. And so, I just don't know if this is the type of thing that he wants to commit to for such a long period of time at this stage in his career and this stage in his life, quite frankly. So I don't think that it sounds like he's official, official, officially saying, I'm not coming back for the Batman. But if you are like myself and Schnepp, the writing has been on the wall for a little while, and this just doesn't convince me that he's going to stick around. Yeah, Shneb, <laughs> any time you're playing a character as iconic as Batman, you probably have 99 problems in dealing with <laughs> fans, and dealing with shoot dates, and right. dealing with the mental, emotional, and physical exhaustion that might come with that. Right. I mean, I get tired of comic book fans online, and I've never played <laughs> Batman. So if you actually are playing the guy, there's going to be a lot of people supporting you and a lot of people going against you. And that's been the case since Ben Affleck, the day he was announced as playing Batman in Batman v Superman. So do you think that, like Clark said, this could be the final nail in the coffin as far as Affleck continuing to be Batman? Well, Mark, I, I never tire of comic book fans online. <laughs> You're the um, sweatiest of them all. I'm the sweaty. Um, but uh, I'll look at it in the positive light. Like, the way Ben has said it is he'd like to, you know, gracefully and coolly segue his way out of this role now. Playing Bruce Wayne is not the issue. I think it's playing Batman and wearing the you know the rubber outfit and like the grueling kind of uh, workouts that he has to do and a bunch of other things. But I would say if if Ben Affleck is gracefully wanting to bow out of playing the Batman, I would look to DC and Warner Brothers to put it together and do the smart thing, which is sort of what a lot of other companies have done and succeeded. Look at Lord of the Rings. The third movie won an Oscar. It's why because they planned it out. Now. There's TV shows that they make 10 episodes and they're able to shoot them in three or four months. My suggestion, work a storyline with Bruce Wayne. I mean, because Matt Reeves has already said he wants to do a younger Batman, how Batman became Batman. You could do an incredible vignetting sequence storyline with Bat the Batman as well as the second Batman and have Batman give the cowl either to by you know a, a noble sacrifice or something you can make a trilogy and and make it work so that you actually have a new batman by the end of the third film that's my suggestion also shoot out bruce wayne for flashpoint get your ducks in a row and then look make that offer to ben affleck look we're, we'll shoot out these three batman films your parts of the these three three films over the course of the next eight months with a couple of pickups I mean, I think it's doable. Look at Robert Downey Jr. He's been able to come back as Iron Man without any issues after a lot of like, I don't know if I'm going to do it. I'm not, I don't know if I'm going to do it. I think Ben Affleck's a great Batman. I think he's a better Bruce Wayne. I think they're both hand in hand. They're, he's a great actor. I think he does a really great job in Justice League. I got a chance to see Justice League. Uh, I guess we could talk about it tomorrow or something. I'm sick of not talking about it. But <laughs> anyway, go see that movie. It's worth seeing. And, uh, you know, I'd like to see him continue to play Batman. So though we've been reporting that he's not going to play Batman, these are only because of what he said. It has nothing to do with like, I've heard some inside scoop or whatever. What he said and then additional things from people in the industry that we know. So it's like backed up was like, look, we're just following what he's already said. So him saying he wants to bow out now isn't any news to us, but I'd like to see it done instead of him just disappearing. You know? Yeah, Ashley, I think that's the big difference between Ben Affleck talking about maybe not being Batman anymore and somebody like Robert Downey Jr. Mm -hmm. gracefully exiting from the role of Tony Stark slash Iron Man is that we have never had reports from industry insiders saying, oh, we're hearing this about Downey and his team. It, every comment from Downey has been, oh, well, yeah, maybe I can't do this forever, but mm -hmm. it's never been insiders who are saying that he's sick of playing the role like we got in that report right before Comic-Con hit about Ben Affleck, and that kind of snowballed everything out of control to where we are now. 
now where we have this story and it's very similar to a headline we ran a couple weeks ago because we are just living in this stasis of not knowing if he's if he wants to come back if he will come back how they will handle that so do you think ben affleck is going to be able to exit on his terms or do you think it's simply going to be a situation where after justice league or after the sequel or suicide squad 2 he just simply is cut and we have a new batman and we don't regard the old one i mean i just don't care the way he exits i just want him to exit after these comments i feel like we've been (laughs) talking about this for a while and after these comments he's been making i'm contemplating i want to leave in a cool way I get that it can be demanding and a difficult role to play and you know it's it's probably grueling on you but there are thousands of people who would be killing to be in your position i get he's been ben affleck he can do whatever he wants but seriously there's so many people that would kill to be in your shoes and you're contemplating leaving girl bye like i'm done it <laughs> sounds like you might be a little sick of reading news stories that no. involve <laughs> ben affleck and batman so what is the way uh, schnepp and clark let me throw this to each of you guys real quick what is the best way way in your opinion as fans <laughs> of comic book movies and Batman in particular what's the best way for them to write a storyline where Ben Affleck no longer has to be Batman does he get killed does he retire what's your take Clark honestly I, and I haven't seen Justice League I've been hearing it's super fun and that's awesome and again just to reiterate I like Ben Affleck I like him as a director I like him as an actor I like him as Bruce Wayne I don't want Ben Affleck to leave again it's just analysis based on sort of what he's saying Mm -hmm. and knowing again the time commitment and the demand that a role like this requires Um, I think DCE the DCEU they've got they've completed Justice League right that that's done, um, and I under and it seems like they're kind of loosening their requirements of everything being connected. Honestly, I think that uh, the Batman should be a standalone. I just think it should, meaning like cast a new Batman. Just start fresh with Matt Reeves, the Batman. So That's we what could I start fresh with a new Batman, Schnapp, and Matt Reeves can cast whoever he wants, and then that could be the Batman that continues on. The DCU has made a point of saying that we don't necessarily need a whole lot of interconnectivity between our movies. We just want to tell great stories. Is that the way to go with you, or do you see more of a uh, flashpoint situation? Yeah, here's my take. Uh, the Batman starts with like J.K. Simmons and Ben Affleck hanging out on the roof rooftop. You know, but he's not in his outfit. He's just he's just Bruce Wayne. And they are talking about something that happened in the past. And then you just have the you vignette the Batman with those characters and go back into the 80s or wherever Matt Reeves wants to take this vision of his Batman, which I think would be fantastic because the 80s is basically where the Dark Knight Returns was born, basically where Batman year one was born. It's the great starting point to start a new Batman when he was younger, because where we are now is Batman in the Justice League is the older guy. And we've got the Flash, we've got Cyborg, these younger guys. So I think it's I think that to me would be satisfying to vignette it and then continue that vignetting through the Batman the second movie. Let Bruce Wayne maybe not be a big part of Flashpoint or as far as Batman, but let Bruce Wayne be that because we know what happens in Flashpoint. If you haven't read the comic, get on it and you'll know what I'm talking about, Thomas Wayne. Um, there's certain things that can happen where it doesn't have to take up all of Ben Affleck's time. They could still weave him through this universe and make it work. And then the third movie can really be a cool kind of jumping off point, whether you want to pass the cowl on to a a Robin or a Nightwing, or you want to make a Batman Beyond kind of spinoff. There's a million different ways to do this where A, it doesn't take up Ben Affleck's life or time. If you just, it's all planning. And we've seen, unfortunately with DC films, they've announced like 300 movies and we'll only have like three of them. I'm still waiting for your Man of Steel. Just call it Superman. What's up with that? I would like to see Henry Cavill get a movie with him as Superman. I mean, I think he's a great actor. He's been shortchanged so far as the way I look at it, but you know, Just League is a course correction for the good as far as a lot of things like that are going. So. There's a lot of cool things that are coming out of Justice League. It's not a dark tunnel of like despair and horror. I think it's actually like, check out, check out the future. Yeah, the one thing that Bruce Wayne did that's very genius is when he created Batman, he made it a symbol. He made it bigger than just a man. And so Bruce Wayne could change hands and have somebody else be Batman. And he wouldn't even have to tell you. The only person he has to tell is Alfred. That's why I wanted to host Movie Talk wearing a mask. That way I could just gracefully exit. Somebody else could come in wearing the mask. And you guys would still think it's Mark Ellis. But I blew it.
All right, speaking <laughs> to somebody who may not want to come back to their role unless you pay them a lot of cheddar, <laughs> what's our next story about? The distribution rights for James Bond expired at Sony after Spectre, which led to studios bidding for the rights to distribute. And now, according to Deadline, a deal between rights holder MGM and distributor Annapurna will likely be finalized later this week as a done deal. While the producers believe Annapurna will have a strong domestic distribution strategy for Bond, MGM and Eon are still looking to see which studio will handle worldwide distribution as 70% of Bond's box office revenue comes from overseas. Clark, what do you think about Annapurna getting the distribution rights for Bond 25? Well, Ashley, you know how I feel oh, yes. about Annapurna. I know, girl. You know. <laughs> this is a fake thing we made up before we started. <laughs> <laughs> like, I have no strong feelings about Annapurna. <laughs> um, so, uh, I actually, I'm shocked to hear, I can't believe I didn't know that 70% of Bond's box office comes from outside of the U.S. That's a staggering number. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, look, uh, I think that um, the the Bond franchise has had a little bit of a tough time over the last year or so, uh, figuring out where they're going to go next, how they can compete and stay relevant in this sort of franchise-heavy uh, blockbuster world. And franchises, by the way, that are going to last four decades in the way that bond lasts for decades. So, um, you know, I think that I'm glad they're getting their ducks in a row. And uh, despite previous reports, Annapurna feels like a great <clears throat> home for it to be in. Yeah, Annapurna uh, has been a production company that has co-financed and co-distributed a lot of different films that range from indies to some that became box office juggernauts like Zero Dark Thirty or American Hustle. Most recently, I believe, I know that they were they, they, they were partially responsible for the movie Detroit with Catherine Bigelow starring John Boyega that came out this past summer. John Schnepp, do you think that Annapurna <clears throat> is the right place to distribute James Bond? Do you have any strong feelings on which studio is going to yeah. be placing this into theaters for our eyeballs? I'm just looking forward to not seeing Seeing like a character like Blofeld hire a PA to print out at Kinko's a bunch of the other villains who've shown up in the other Bond movies and like to artfully paste them in a building that it's about to explode retardedly. I mean, it's all the worst writing I can possibly imagine. So, um, yeah, uh, Annapurna, I'm very happy that they're distributing it. <laughs> I'm looking more forward to the Terminator new movie with Tim Miller. So that's that's what's more exciting to me. I mean, to me, uh, Daniel Craig as James Bond, it's like, I thought he was done. So I was kind of looking forward to a new James Bond. So now I just kind of like, well, I hope they get a good script. I don't yeah, look, know. what you need when you're making a movie is a lot of different things. You need a star, and we got Daniel Craig back, okay? So now we need someone to distribute it, and now we got Annapurna. Good. I don't know... Like, like I'm, I, it's very rare I'm sitting in a movie and I notice, man, you know what? The distributor of this movie, you know, <laughs> I notice the framing's a little off. Do they they got to work? I don't know how that works. All I know is that I want this movie to be in theaters on time. So now what you need is you need a director. You need the cast and the crew to flesh itself out. The top directors that are being mentioned right now to direct the new Bond movie include Jan Damage, who did that movie 71. I think he'd be a great choice. Denny Villeneuve's name is always kicked around for anything involving any project. Project. David McKenzie is another very interesting one who did Hell or High Water. Taylor Sheridan wrote Hell or High Water, directed Wind River. I wouldn't sneeze at that choice either. Clark, do you hear any of these names that I said so far that you think should be the front runner for James Bond from a directing standpoint? I mean, I thought Villeneuve would have been fun. However, he, I believe, recently was like, no, I'm not doing that. Yeah. And I know that he wants to do Dune and, and all of those things. So I think he's off the off the table. Um, but, you know, again, like it, the thing with talking about Bond is just that um, the the creatives behind the scenes, they, they have some such a specific idea of what they want and what is allowed and what can be canon. And, and so that's going to affect the directors that you bring on board. And so, um, you know, I, I, when it comes to thinking outside the box, I feel like someone like Denny Villeneuve would have been still sort of working within the parameters that the Broccoli's want, but also bringing some things that are exciting to the forefront. But as I just said, and as we know, he's, he's out. So I have no idea. I don't know who this goes to, honestly. Yeah. John Skihanep. I would have gone with, uh, you know, the guys who directed John Wick, but they're, like, actually developing a Hitman Hulu series right now, mm -hmm. so I feel like they're going to be taken up, their time will be taken up. But I think, you know, going with someone who's a, a fresh action director is who I would pick. I would, I, I mean, Taylor Sheridan is a good choice. Um, I, I loved, I was, Rin, Wind River? Is mm -hmm. that was, yeah. Um, or Wind River. Yeah, Wind River. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, 
it's hard to tell. I would have I would have loved to see uh, Villeneuve, but yeah, he's already he's doing Dune, so he's out. So right now, Ashley, this movie is scheduled for release <laughs> November eighth, mm -hmm. two thousand nineteen, and at that date, it sounds a little familiar. It might be because there was also news yesterday that Wonder Woman two, which was originally scheduled for release in mid December two thousand nineteen, yeah. has moved off that date and is now November first. 2019. Some people were speculating it was to get away from Star Wars, others to capitalize on the Thanksgiving mm -hmm. and the pre-holiday season push that Thor Ragnarok is obviously benefiting from right now. Wonder Woman in theaters one week, James Bond in the next week. Can Jimmy Bond, in all of his infinite age and winsome and martini liver, can he compete with Wonder Woman 2? Uh, not at all. Um, <laughs> not in the slightest. But um, I find it interesting that we're getting all this Wonder Woman news when we were just the other day talking about Gal Gadot saying, you know, I'm going to stay away from this movie if, you know, um, Rat, 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 Rat Pack Rat. Entertainment doesn't mm -hmm. get off the movie. So I think it's interesting that we're still seeing movement in that. But um, yeah, he doesn't stand a chance. Sorry. Sorry. And speaking of movies in <laughs> theaters soon, you'll have to wait till 2019 to see Justice League. Why, that movie's available in theaters this very week. And we're sure a lot of you guys bought your tickets. And we're going to tell you a little bit about it right now. Yup. Justice League is coming out. Fueled by his restored faith in humanity and inspired by Superman's selfless act, Bruce Wayne enlists newfound ally Diana Prince to face an even greater threat. Together, Batman and Wonder Woman work quickly to recruit a team to stand against his newly awakened enemy. All right, so here we go. You are going to have non-spoiler reviews available today on both Collider Video and Schmozno YouTube channel, so stay right here for that. As far as me just giving my bird's eye view take on Justice League, I thought it was awesome. I loved watching Justice League, and it's very rare that somebody like me is going to sit in a movie for two hours or however long the flick is and immediately say, I want to go again. Like, I'm a kid at an amusement park that just had a really fun roller coaster, and I want to hop on immediately. That's how I felt after Justice League was over. I, I wanted to, I was on the, the studio lot, and I just wanted to be like, hey, can we... Can we run this back? There's a lot of fun stuff in there. And I love the, the pace that the film moved at. I had a great time watching Justice League. John Schnepp, are you as positive on this movie as I am? I'm definitely positive on this film. I mean, there's a lot of uneven uh, parts to this film. Uh, you know, do, does, it look, does it feel like two different directors made it? No, it doesn't. But there's definitely some kind of like the two hour runtime. I'm looking, you know, hey, look. They double dip all the time. I'll, I'll buy your three and a half hour Blu-ray when it comes out of Just League because I'd like to see some of those scenes that feel clipped a little bit expanded. But, you know, I don't feel like I was gypped of anything like, oh, I'm missing a scene. It just felt like it's moving like a freight train, uh, which could be a good thing because it never I was never bored. Um, it, there's there's some moments in here, especially for comic book fans who are going to like really freak out. There's some really good, not just Easter eggs, but really just good scenes that are satisfying. So, I mean, if you've been looking forward to seeing a Justice League movie your entire life, it's here. So I that's was what bothered say. when like Batman v Superman or Suicide Squad came out and I didn't love those movies. And then you had this Ultimate Edition Blu-ray and this has all the scenes that you really want to see. And I didn't find the theatrical release good enough to warrant me buying this 20 or 25 30 dollar piece of right. entertainment that's going to give me 30 minutes of additional scenes that if they were so good why didn't you just put them in the movie in the first place even if it did enhance batman v superman this is a very different scenario i had such a great time watching this movie that i would buy any sort of ultimate edition i'd be curious to see what scenes were left out that zack snyder thought might be in there or what joss whedon shot that he couldn't fit in there because i want to explore this movie further clark you have not got a chance to see this but is this on the docket is this on the to-do list on the wolf fridge right now <laughs> judging by my previous comments are you shocked that i was not invited to a pre-screening don't worry <laughs> annapurna is not distributing oh, this. Good, okay, okay. annapurna is not involved <laughs> oh in this. good all right well in that case um yeah i think i'm excited i'm looking forward to it i have a movie pass now Yay. so uh, that makes it able me able to see all kinds of things you know um affordably and not necessarily have to prioritize as much like what I'm going to, you know, spend my hard-earned dollars on. Um, but look, I've been hearing great things about the movie. Um, I think everybody who grew up loving these characters wants the DCEU to succeed, and I am one of those people. And so, uh, yeah, and also I'm a, you know, as you guys know, I'm a big Joss Whedon fan, and so I, I'm looking forward to seeing, you know, I, his um, contribution, uh, even if it is, you know, in tandem with, with someone like Zack Snyder, which, again, Zack Snyder has a beautiful visual style. And so um, 
I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing how all of this comes together. Well, Let me just say, a, uh, yeah, do ahead. not do not leave. There are two post credit scenes that you want to see because they are oh. fantastic. And the Flash and Wonder Woman steal this movie. And it somebody returns, and it's a great a great t- thing to see this one person come back. It's a good note can't, that you can't need really to stick talk around about all it. the way until the end of yeah. the. So you you it's like you, you get two post credit scenes. So if you see a post credit scene, you're like, oh, do they have another? Do I see? Yeah, you you stick around for that, Ashley. You've been <laughs> on fire recently, seeing movies in the theater. Boom. Boom, or are we continuing boom, this, boom. the hot streak this weekend? Yeah, because I, too, have a movie pass. This is not sponsored, by the way. Paid nope, for my own money. Sponsored, but sponsored by movie pass. Sounds like you're shilling something. Oh, my gosh. Can't um, believe they got paid off by movie pass. Yeah, uh, uh, I wish. It took, like, three months for me to get my card. Anyways, they're on back order. Um, I'm really excited to see this. I like the news that we were talking about the other day that it had to be under two hours. Because me, I like a movie that's like, boom, 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 boom. And Schnapp, you said that there's, you know, they cut out the fluff, which I really like. So that makes me even more excited to see it. She's not a fan of fluff, and she's not a fan of getting her movie pass late you need a babysitter <laughs> for rufus you let me know happy to look after that little guy well you go enjoy justice league we're going to move on to buy or sell this is the part of the show ashley's going to give us a premise we'll say whether we buy it or sell it and use space bucks according to the rap sony is moving forward on yet another spider-man spinoff this time setting power rangers writers burke sharpless and matt sazama to pen a Mo- to pen a morbius feature project centered on spider-man anti-hero morbius the living vampire morbius was created by writer Roy Thomas and artist Gil Kane and first appeared in Amazing Spider-Man 101, the first issue not written by Spider-Man co-creator Stan Lee. Details of Sony's take on the character are not known at this time and a release date has not been secured. Schnapp Byers saw a Spider-Man spinoff movie featuring Morbius. Morbius, the living vampire? That's so, so, so weird that the reason he's been called the living vampire is because of these weird 70s comic book rules where vampires had to be alive. Look it up. It's are crazy. Are vampires a lot like like the Twilight kids? Are they, they are they alive? They shine or they, and, are they and undead? glisten. They glisten. They Mark. sparkle. They sparkle. Okay, I see that they're shiny. I see that they they look like Mark, they just left Mark, the strip club. Mark, I can't tell you the secrets of the undead. Otherwise, Ooh. I'd have to kill you and then make you a living vampire. I can't wait for this Sony movie, and I want it to tie in. I can't wait to see Peter Parker in Morbius, the living vampire, saying really funny things about <laughs> him being called Morbius, the living vampire. You would probably imagine that they're going to make a joke or two about that. My limited experience with Morbius does include having a number of the comic books from days of yore when I was in comic book stores just about every day after school in the 90s. What I always took away from the artwork is that it's some of the coolest imagery I've ever seen in in any comic book and any and any line, DC Marvel image whatever it was the Morbius stuff was really intriguing to me and so seeing that this is a live action movie I think it's so refreshing because whatever you want to say about Spider-Man Homecoming it's hard to make that feel wholly fresh when we've gotten so many different origin takes on Spider-Man but now you have somebody like Morbius you have a living vampire coming in to the greater MCU and even if it's just in that standalone Sony verse it doesn't matter because it's a new, fresh take on a character that we have not seen on the big screen before. So I'm very excited about this news. How about you, Clark? Well, I actually have a question for you gentlemen who are well more well-versed in this than I. How interwoven with Peter Parker is this character? Meaning, like, does it make sense that they could stand separately? I know you believe that he will show up. I probably believe that he will show up. But let's say, hypothetically, if we're playing by Sony's right. rules, that, that Peter Parker isn't involved. Like, does that make sense to you? you guys it, he doesn't have to be involved like blade does, didn't need any of the other characters it didn't even have dracula which is where blade originally came from was was from tomb of dracula so i mean all of these characters uh have enough backstory and are interesting enough to stand on their own for two hours without having to like lean on another another character but it would be i think it's it would be missing a a really cool thing to have that tie-in especially with venom and silver and black and sony trying to build and weave out their like whole spider-man universe you gotta have peter parker show up yeah what i remember trying to wrap my 12 year old brain around was that morbius was somebody who fought spider-man but he he was a doctor who he had some rare blood disease or something. He tried to cure himself, and he ended up getting this form of vampirism that made him, 
you know, I don't think he he turned into a bat, but it he made was like, him alive like the living vampire. <laughs> exactly how he acted too. So he could tangle with Spider Man at some point, but I'd also like to. I mean, if he wants to get in the ring against Venom in this in whatever universe this is that is away from the MCU, I'd sign up for that as well. So if you announce names like Venom and Morbius, would I love to see them participate in events with Spider Man? Sure, but it's if I know Spider Man is not in this movie, it's not going to be enough for me to be like, oh wait, hold on and i think i speak for ashley with her movie past that you hear a living vampire you're probably going to be a little intrigued well i'm uh it's tough to say was this did you say this about a doctor who wanted to be a bat no a doctor you know i, I think he the whole thing is he didn't want to be a bat he had a rare blood disease oh, tried to cure it, himself because i was like and, nine years of school to be a bat that sucks yeah, ashley I mean, he became a living vampire well i heard i you know i was trying to do my research I guess on this movie and to see that the what to see what these writers have written in the past Dracula untold oof oof and we're we're going in the same oh, oh. Uh, sell this Woo. because of Dracula untold I just I hated that movie and to mm. see these writers come on board for another type of you know uh what's the thing with the fame? vampire vampire hey, but yeah. actually they're familiar with this Vlad thing and the whole Dracula thing so come on or, he's a living vampire in theory they wrote a really great Dracula movie and Universal who is on my shit list Ooh, right, right now. Under Anna yeah, Purna. I said it. Annapurna and Universal. I got Duking knuckle sandwiches for fun. <laughs> I'm going to look at it. I'm going to be very positive about this. No, but that's gonna, what I'm saying. I'm yeah. sorry. That was my point, is that they may have written a really great vampire slash Dracula movie, and the studio was like, okay, cool, thanks, and given it to other writers who did rewrites, and et cetera, et cetera. So maybe this really is their opportunity to write the vampire movie that they wanted to write. Look, we're getting into the thick of the NBA season, and what does a great shooter do? You keep shooting. You miss your first five shots, you keep shooting, because you might make your next five shots. What does this mean in... Relation to this story, you, you had a bad vampire movie. <laughs> Just keep cracking them out because eventually you're going to get a good one uh. if you're Reggie Miller. All right, next story. The new trailer for Fox's upcoming musical drama, The Greatest Showman, has landed online. Featuring musical works of Academy Award winning La La Land lyricists Ben Pasek and Justin Paul, the movie is inspired by the imagination of P.T. Barnum and tells a visionary of a visionary who rose from nothing to create a spectacle that became a worldwide sensation. The movie stars Hugh Jackman, Zac Efron, and Michelle Williams and opens in theaters on December 22nd. Mark Byersell, the new trailer for The Greatest Showman. I buy the trailer because there's a lot of great visuals in there. Hugh Jackman, Zac Efron, Michelle Williams, whole bunch of stars. And then the release date, it's a Christmas movie. This is going to sweep families off their feet. Everybody's going to want to rush into the theater to see this, presuming you already saw The Last Jedi. And so the trailer I buy, the question mark I have about The Greatest Showman is that it's inspired by the life of P.T. Barnum, or inspired by the imagination of P.T. <laughs> Barnum. So are you allowed to cherry pick elements of P.T. Barnum's life then put them in this fantasy world and say we're inspired by that but we're going to stay away from a lot of the real life of P.T. Barnum. Is that fair or foul, Schnepp? Well, I, you know, kids at home, just Google P.T. Barnum. Look him up. Um, this is a fantasy version. It doesn't look like Logan. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> he doesn't look like Hugh Jackman. Um, you know, it's nice when they make musicals. I, I think some musicals are great. Um, I sell this trailer. I think, you know, making this, you know, big thing about the circus and, you know, I mean, you're not going to see anything about like how elephants and animals right, and lions right. are abused and the horror of P.T. Barnum's gross circus, which I think is garbage. Um, so to, to make it like this big fluff piece and like, look how great everything is. And we're, it's a, it just felt horrible to me. Um, yeah, so I, I got to sell it, the trailer. It's hard to, to juxtapose the, the fun that we saw in this trailer, Clark, with the, the modern things that we know and have heard horror stories about what a real circus entails and what happens to animals in a circus. So can you look past that with this trailer, or is this something that's going to cloud your image of the movie? Well, this is a tough one for me because I love Hugh Jackman, and I also love original movie musicals. And I couldn't believe when I looked this up that this was an original movie musical. I mean, this is not based on a Broadway show or, or anything like that which I think is awesome. Um, but I am selling this because I have not liked any of these trailers. And I feel it, there is just something about this that does not sit right to me. It looks 
a little goofy. It looked to me, it looks a little schmaltzy. Um, and the music, if you listen to the music in the trailer, that's the music that they are singing, meaning it sounds like a contemporary soundtrack mm -hmm. set against an old, um, set against an old uh, or, or um, period uh, setting. And not that I have a problem with that. Like I really enjoyed that in Moulin Rouge. Um, and there are, there are things that I, where I do like that, but for some reason, this is just not landing with me, so I'm going to sell it. It's a tough tone to hit if you have contemporary music set against the period backdrop. Ashley, you watched this mm -hmm. trailer. You might have seen it two or three times when we watched it for the first time. Yeah, I'm a little bit torn because I did like the trailer, but it's hard for me to separate um, the animal abuse factor, the... Um, the idea behind the circus and you know the elephants and stuff it's hard for me to get behind this movie completely just because of that idea but i did like the trailer i don't know it made me like you know it was inspirational this guy and his dreams are coming true but besides that i don't know and part of me kept going to like american horror story like i thought something scary was going to happen but and kathy uh, bates was going to show up that's a bearded woman movie. yeah i yeah. want to see that movie. yeah but th i mean that's what i got from this trip i didn't even i don't remember seeing any actual animals in the trailer so if if you mm -hmm. are just cherry picking elements of reality and you say well we want to take the circus vibe but we don't want to bring any animals mm -hmm. along i'm fine with that because it did feel like this person played by Hugh Jackman was creating an all-inclusive environment where people who may have felt like outcasts from society get to perform and get to do something and feel like they're part of a family. <laughs> if that's the story that we're telling, then I'd be on board for it, but still a little shaky, but I'm going to go ahead and buy the trailer. Yes, I can occasionally get into musicals. It just it, It's a little <laughs> weird for me when they start singing the first five minutes. Oh, it takes yeah. five or ten minutes for my brain to adjust <laughs> to what's happening. And no, I'm still not excited for the Mary Poppins movie. <laughs> I'm going to remind you guys that there's an all-new episode of Collider Heroes as of yesterday, hosted by that young man right over there, the sweatiest of them all, Mr. John Schnepp. Speaking of comic books, we have our top 50 superhero movies of all time. The list keeps on chewing, so make sure you guys check out a whole new episode that dropped this morning. We have a new Schmodown dropping later on today. And like I said, Justice League reviews, both on Collider Video and on Schmoes. No spoiler-free from right now, but we will have spoiler reviews going into the weekend stay tuned for that we're going to save some time at the end of this show for your live twitter questions go ahead and start tweeting us at collider video in the meantime we go to mailbag you can email us anytime collider video at gmail.com ashley you clicked on one was it spam yeah well it's from john and they write hey collider crew can you help settle a debate i'm having with my friends you're damn right they just announced wonder woman 2 as moving from its december 13th 2019 release date to november 1st 2019 i realized it would be good going against Star Wars Episode 9 a week later on December 20th. So obviously, Wonder Woman 2 is moving because of it, but my friends are saying Wonder Woman moved to a Justice League date in order to have more time in theaters and over Thanksgiving. Do you think it's that, or do you think Star Wars caused them to move? Thanks for taking my question. To quote that punk-ass kid in the backseat <laughs> of A League of Their Own, when Gina Davis says, how about I slap you around for a while, can it be both? I think this could be both. I think you definitely don't want to tangle with Star Wars Episode Nine, the conclusion of the new trilogy. But you also look at what Thor Ragnarok and presumably what Justice League is going to do in November. And this has always been a great landing spot for a blockbuster. Yes, we're inundated with Oscar and Academy Award contender movies around this time of year. But there's also appetite for a movie that the whole family can go see together if you get that open the beginning of November, you have a few weeks to really make your box office stamp and then head into Thanksgiving with a lot of momentum. So, Schnepp, I think that this makes sense on both fronts. Do you think there was one deciding factor between Star Wars or just getting an earlier jump on the holiday season? The only decision is money. So you can counter both of those. There's mul multiple reasons for it to open earlier, and it's all about money. It's like, look, you know Star Wars is, is going to crush it, you know, Wonder Woman 2 is going to crush it. Both of them are like, look, do we have to go head to head? Can we have a couple weeks apart? Look, we'll move. You've already staked out Christmas. See you later. It's, it's end of story. It's, it just makes sense. All of us win. Clark Wolf, do we all win if Wonder Woman comes out November 1st? Yeah, I think so. And I also think that they looked at Thor and were like, okay, this is good. And Justice League is probably tracking really mm. well for this weekend. And so it was kind of a no-brainer. But I wanted to mention that if we think back to Wonder Woman from this summer, Wonder Woman had legit staying power. Like Wonder Woman hung around in the yeah. theaters um, in, <laughs> and really, really crushed that domestic uh, box office because people kept seeing 
bringing it. And so I think that they're actually really smart to release this early in the holiday season right. so that when kids have break and when there's school and when there's a free weekend and you have Thanksgiving break and then you have Christmas break, parents and families and such will go and see this movie multiple times. Excellent points all. Ashley, Wonder mm -hmm. Woman coming out November 1st. Are they yeah. scared of Star Wars? Do they have reason to fear Star Wars? I mean, mm. Wonder Woman, I think, can stand on its own. Uh, I think that they should be, honestly. I mean, realistically, I think that Star Wars is probably going to read it out. But, um, you know, I think it's a smart move and because it's kind of geared towards a similar audience. So why not give them an opportunity to see both? And you also have the Avatar movie. It should be coming out oh, somewhere yeah. around the holiday season. I just think with Star Wars, too, Star Wars has made itself known that it is now a holiday mm -hmm. new tradition with The Force Awakens opening and Rogue One and now The Last Jedi. The Han Solo movie coming out in May of 2018 was the one that actually surprised me that they stayed on that date instead of just going back to the Christmas well. But Episode Nine still on schedule to be released Christmas time. Wonder Woman coming out six weeks before it now. Makes sense for all parties. James Bond, keep drinking. We're going to go to your live Twitter questions now. Ashley Mova's got a few of them queued up. What are we looking at? What are they saying about the vest? Well, they love it. <laughs> yeah. and I always feel a little little weird. I feel like an old-timey bartender. Sharp. What will it be, Mac? <laughs> Chris Myers <laughs> sent us a link to a report from the Wall Street Journal, and it says Mario Brothers set to jump to big screen in movie deal with Universal's Illumination. How do you feel about that, huh? Oh, boy. Um, Mario Brothers. It, when you think of Super Mario Brothers, I think of the video game. A lot of people, if you're thinking of the big screen, you think about the, the Bob Hoskins, John Leguizamo anti-classic. <laughs> Illumination Entertainment, they're the ones that do the Minions. They're the ones that do Despicable Me. I would be curious to see a trip. I'm not going to get too excited about this just yet, but Mario, he's... He's, he's great. I, I want Luigi involved, too. I don't want this to be a Mario's. This has to be Mario and Luigi rescuing a princess together. Let's get back to basics. If you want to throw some go-karts in there, have at it. Clark Wolf, how do you feel? Yeah, I think, um, you know, a lot. every studio at this point is trying to get their Lego movie uh, or their Lego franchise. And I, I can't remember. We talked about it on Movie Talk, but Lord and Miller were attached to write a movie where, oh, where I was like, Oh, that makes sense. It's mm -hmm. like they're the new Lego movie for that studio. And so to me, this just sounds like it's it's Lego movie for Universal. Schnapp, Super Mario. <laughs> Can he come back in animated form? Yeah, Wreck-It Ralph. That's what I want to see him popping around in that. Can we have a marathon of all these movies? Double Dragon, Mario Brothers, <laughs> no. uh, Street Fighter. To top it off with Mortal Kombat. I mean, uh, dude, that'll be pretty do incredible. Do not disgrace the name Mortal Kombat by lumping it no, in. No, that with has to be the last one. Movies. You save the best for last, but... Just imagine watching all of these movies. <laughs> Assassin's Creed, <laughs> Warcraft. I mean, come on. Yeah, that double That's dragon That's a lot of one. movies. Robert Patrick is the villain, Ooh. and uh, Raul Julia is M. Bison. There yeah. was a, there were, they casted really good actors. They yeah. just, man, those movies were just so bad. Yep. I think this would be the right way. If you had to have Super Mario come back, do an animated form with Illumination Entertainment. If a minion wants to pop in, I ain't going to complain. <laughs> Next Twitter question is... Kimberly Grosser writes, It's my birthday tomorrow, and I was wondering, what is your favorite birthday scene in a movie? Oh, happy birthday. Favorite birthday scene. I'll tell you my least favorite birthday scene in the movie. Okay, it's, it gets me a little <laughs> emotional, so prepare yourselves. There's a movie that came out in the early 90s starring Jodie Foster called Little Man Tate. And this kid, he just was not popular. He was maybe third or fourth grade or something like that. <clears throat> and he wanted to have a birthday party. So all the kids would come, and then he could like be like, oh, cool, fun. He hands out invitations at recess. He's handing them out. Him and his mom, they worked all day on these invitations, and he's handing them out, and everybody's accepting them, and it's cool. And it's like, oh, my God, this is happening. All these kids are going to come to my birthday party. Then the bell rings for the next class to start, and all the kids run in, and they throw the invitations on the ground. No! And this is your favorite no this is the this is the my first thought when i think of a birthday scene in a movie is how horrible children are all this kid wanted to do you were gonna get free cake you're gonna get free juice probably uh, maybe even sneaking a dr pepper mark let me turn this around all right my favorite most memorable birthday scene in any movie is 16 candles that was mine you say and it's your birthday Clark, it's my birthday too that's right and <laughs> that freeze frame at the end them kissing over the birthday cake you got it. Nailed it, Schnapp. 
Nailed it. All right. Well, thank you guys for rescuing my <laughs> nosedive. I could have gone all. We could have done another hour of movie talk. Just me lamenting this poor, this poor. <laughs> all he wanted to do is have you come to his birthday. What What were you doing that Saturday that was so vital to your existence as a human? God, kids are terrible. Ashley Mova, your favorite oh birthday scene? Can you think of one? The only scene I can think of right now is thirteen going on thirty. And oh she's yes, thirty, flirty, and thriving, thirty, and then she becomes. 30 and flirty and thriving. You know what I'm talking about? Yes, I know. I mean, <laughs> when you say you know what I'm talking about, have I heard of the movie 13 yeah. going on 30? I've heard of the I movie. I that movie. Yeah. It's the yeah. Andy Circus <laughs> classic. 13 Come on going on now. Andy Serkis isn't 13 sure going is on 30. Okay, just to brighten things up a little bit, I will say that the birthday scene that started off the hilarious chain of events in 1997's Liar Liar, yep. where the kid says he wishes his dad, Fletcher Reed, couldn't tell a lie, blows out the candles. Next thing you know, Jim carries off on a wacky adventure, and uh, the movie changed my life forever liar liar <laughs> there we go all right our last twitter question of the day Ooh. shall be albert rod rod harma writes what are some of the most damaged actors slash actresses careers due to typecasting due to oh, typecasting type that's an interesting casting. one well it's yeah. always you know you see an actor who they get kind of pigeonholed into a role and then when you watch them try to break out i mean even you look at somebody like jim carrey who had a great year maybe the best year an actor's ever had in 1994 and then he wanted to break out and have more dramatic roles vince vaughn played vince vaughn in a lot of movies but he was able to break out to some degree of success and if you watch brawl and cell block 99 that's a very different take yeah. on an actor like that as far as being typecast, now, can you think of one actor or actress that we just always look at them to be this one type of person? Well, I would say uh, most definitely, in my mind, the first name that popped up was Christopher Reeve. I mean, mm -hmm. because he had done a lot of other films time after time, or I'm sorry, somewhere in time. Um, and uh, the I can't remember the one with uh, Michael Caine. What was that? Oh, yeah. Uh, Mousetrap? Something trap. It's. I think it's. I think it's mouse trap. All right. Somebody. Google That's a that. great board game. <clears throat> but anyway, it's. I, I'm almost sure it's not mouse trap. I'll look it up. But uh, Chris Reeve, because he he's a great actor, but he did such. He's put such a strong impression and rebranded the Superman from everyone's original, like George Reeves. Mm -hmm. Then it became Chris Reeve. So it's sort of like. It was hard to see him in other films, I think, for the general audience. Yeah, some names that uh, are popping up on IMDb right now, because I put the search in, is uh, Michael Sarah and uh, Death Trap. Vin Diesel. Thank you, Cody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Death Trap. Yeah. Michael Sarah and, 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 and Vin Diesel. It's all, I mean, there's certain actors that get typecast just because that's, that's who they can play, you know? You look at moron Steven Seagal, and even when he was popular <laughs> in America, He's not anymore. Is he was just doing the same role in action movies in the early nineties because he wasn't Bruce Willis. He he right. wasn't able to pull off anything else. And so you have action stars that that's what we know them for. We don't really want to see you try to be dramatic. You just stay beating up people on a navy boat. Mine would be you guys are gonna roll your eyes and that's okay. Uh, not you guys maybe, but the audience. I'm prepared uh, to roll. Is, uh, I'm gonna roll. Sarah Jessica Parker. So people think Sarah Jessica Parker is Carrie Bradshaw from Sex and the City. She's absolutely not. She is a very interesting, quirky, weird human being, and she has some incredible, fun, cool performances from Ed Wood to First Wives Club. She's the other woman in that too, and and, and even in her more recent career, um, I think she's a really really, really talented mm. actress, and I think she's a talented performer and producer, but people think that she is Carrie Bradshaw because Sex and the City is so iconic, and well, she's absolutely not. What was her name in Square Pegs? Oh, yeah, I don't know. Callback yeah. Machine. Yeah, let, 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 let's see Cody run around <laughs> and give us that answer. Well, it's Jessica Parker's <laughs> name in Square Pegs, Cody. Actually, anybody him? off the top of your head that gets typecast? Uh, Harry Potter, man, Dale Radcliffe, I'm sorry to say. I can't, oh. can't see you be any other person. You're Harry Potter. Like, yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a tough one as I now look into the camera and try to kill some time before Cody runs over yeah, and gives John Schneider. Patty Green! Patty. Cody with the answer! <laughs> Patty Green. Wow. I'm not rolling my eyes at Clark's pick. I'm just still getting so emotional over why you couldn't go to that kid's birthday party. Oh my it's a Saturday. Gosh, it's you didn't terrible. have anything to do. You could have gone. You could even stop by for 30 minutes. You just had to throw the... You couldn't even act like you're going to go. Put the invitation in your book oh. and then just not let the kid know you weren't going to show up. 
Sixteen ah. candles. Okay. He said your birthday. Da, na, 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 na. <laughs> it's my birthday too. Yeah. Da, na, na, na. There's one thing that can brighten my day. It is a Beatles tune. Thank you guys for tuning in to this episode of Collider Video. Make sure you guys subscribe right here to the channel for Ashley Mova, Clark Wolf, John Schnepp, and our very hardworking whiteboard writing production <laughs> crew. <laughs> we will see you guys tomorrow for a new Collider Movie Talk. Hey everybody, Mark Ellis here. Thanks for watching this episode of Collider Movie Talk. You wanna watch more? Then click up here, or you can click right here for more great content from Collider. And if you haven't subscribed to Collider Video, do so right now and share this vid with your friends. Thanks for watching.